Welcome to Full Momentum, an HEC RAS podcast. I'm your host, Ben Carey, here joining me as always, Chris Goodell. Chris, welcome to episode 28 of this podcast series. we got some really exciting topics today. We're going to have an opportunity mm-hmm. to answer some, some user questions from folks that follow the podcast. Um, a lot of cool stuff. And then on top of all of that, we got the NCAA tournament that's starting this week. You just got some exciting news on your house that you're building. A lot of, a lot of good, yeah. uh, good vibes right now in the HEC Raz uh, full momentum world. I think the best thing though is the weather has been unbelievable the last few days. I mean, for March, mid March here in uh, Western Oregon, holy cow! I mean, mid seventies, sunny. I mean, it can't get any better. Yeah, it's but, it's uh it's it's really good weather, but I was it's interesting. I was talking to a coworker today who is doing planning on some doing some field work in Alaska in the next couple months and their timelines for getting field work done are getting moved up significantly mm-hmm. um because a lot of the snow melt and and glacier melt that's going to be occurring, which normally happens in April May is already starting because of that same warm front. So, um mm. interesting impacts in the uh, water resources world here on the on the west coast of the United States. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's nice. So you mentioned my property. The The weather um, is drying things out up there, which is really good because right now uh, where I'm building or getting ready to build a house up there, it's too muddy to do anything. But one thing that they could do, and we did this last week, was drill my well. So you know, this is, it's sort of water related. So I thought we could talk about it here, but, um, yeah, I had a, uh, a well driller come out and they got this huge drill rig. Um, it elevates a tower up. It's like, I don't know, 40 feet high or something crazy like that. And, uh, they just got a bunch of these pipes, they call them sticks that they uh, thread together and they just start drilling. It's amazing how fast they go through even solid basalt um we're talking like 20 feet would take them about five to seven minutes to get through and you know all the while it's just spitting out all of this sludge and 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 uh, rock chips all over the place makes some really good gravel but the good news is we actually did hit water and there's always a risk you're not going to although i think the risk was pretty low on my site but always a risk you won't get it but we got 55 gallons per minute at 406 feet deep which is pretty good and i'll take that it's going to give us lots of water i got no even semblance of an idea of whether 406 feet is deep for it seems pretty deep for a well but is that is that normal is that is that shallow what's what's well it it was shallower than they expected or they budgeted or um estimated for and and that's all based on all the different wells around the area Mm, and he's he's drilled most of them and so he looks at all these different wells and well logs and goes, okay, well, just kind of seeing what the trend looks like, I'm guessing you're probably going to be 460 feet. And it was just 406. So oh, okay. that's cool. It saves us a little bit of money. And we actually got more water than he expected, too. He was thinking maybe around 40 gallons per minute. So um, if you're trying to kind of visualize how much discharge that is, um, just think of a 55 gallon drum and filling that up in one minute. And that's what we got. So okay. that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. So it's, tournament time's coming up, huh, Ben? Yeah. Exciting yeah. Tournament stuff, starts man. this Thursday. Um, I will be taking Thursday and Friday off work. Uh, it's my annual, annual, uh, mini vacation that I take every March, uh, to watch yeah. basketball. And, um, obviously it should be, should be a good time. We have our, our, uh, our company, little office pool that we do, we fill out brackets. So it's a it's a fun time of year as a sports fan for sure. Uh, what's the what's the best you've ever done in the office pool? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, probably like third. I don't I don't think I've ever won. Um, but yeah, um, I was I was I think last year was my best chance to win at Klein Schmidt. Anyway, you know I've been doing these for a long time, but. Um, and I was looking like, oh, there's a shot I could win this thing. And then I can't even remember what it was, but a few very important teams lost in my bracket. And I went down. To, I think I probably got somewhere in the 10th place range, ultimately. Solid. But I was right there. I was thinking, oh, I might I might have a shot here to win this. Yeah, well, you know, you just got to survive the first weekend. Um, my father-in-law always says uh, you can never win your bracket pool 
in the first weekend, but you can definitely lose it on the first weekend. <laughs> so um, that's if you, true. If you follow yeah. brackets, I hope you enjoy uh, watching basketball this week. Um, but we got some exciting Raz content to get to, so let's go ahead and jump yeah. into that. Um, before we do, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, our sponsor. Um, we're thankful to be sponsored by our engineering firm that you and I will both work for, Chris Kleinschmidt Associates, who is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. Um, one of the things that you can learn uh, at kleinschmidtgroup.com is about upcoming classes that Chris and I have. Um, we just finished last week our 2024 spring 1D, 2D HEC RAS course. It's a six-week course. It went really well. I think we had almost 40 people um, that attended it. So it was a great size, uh, yep. really, really good class. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, our next online class, if you're interested in, in taking it, will be um, hosted again online over the course of six weeks. One day a week, we do lectures and then we have workshops in between. Um, and that's going to run from October 9th to November 13th. So it's going to be a fall class. Um, so if you're interested, definitely visit kleinschmidtgroup.com uh, and you should be able to find the link to, to sign up for more information and eventually the actual the class itself. In addition to the online class, we also have finalized dates for our in-person class this year, which is going to be in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, from September nice. 10th to the 12th. Um, so that's a three day course. It's a little bit more intensive. So instead of spreading it out over six weeks, we do three days of eight hours a day, all at one location. It's in person, so it's a it's a fun way to interact. Um, we get usually a lot more questions and, and things like that. Atlanta is a great location. We're really excited to go down there and um, it's been a while since I don't think I've ever taught down there. You have, but it's been a few years, right, Chris? Wait, so when is this again? What month? September 10th to the 12th. September. Okay. So we're not like midsummer, but it's probably still yeah. going to be pretty hot there. But uh, I, I promise you we'll be in an air conditioned yeah. location. <laughs> we won't do We won't do but, outdoor classroom for that. For that class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Atlanta's great. Uh, Atlanta's awesome. It's got a really cool downtown area and a lot of good restaurant options. And it's just a good walking around place. So yeah. I love, I probably taught, I don't know. Uh, I don't think this is an exaggeration, but probably six or seven classes in Atlanta. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And um, for those that are interested, uh, we don't have the exact location where the class will be held, picked out yet. We'll have that information soon, and we'll certainly share that with you all once we have that. Um, it probably is going to be in the general vicinity of where Georgia Tech is at. Um, again, not necessarily on the campus of Georgia Tech, but in that area of atlanta i know atlanta is obviously a very large city so if you're kind of picking out generally trying to understand where that might be um, that's that's probably where we're going to end up so again more information will will come out and we'll definitely share that with you all uh, as soon as we have it there's also an outside chance knock on wood that we will be hosting uh our annual hec ras pub and grub following that class that has not been finalized yet I do want to tease that out, though, um, because if we get enough people that sign up for the Atlanta class, that might open up our opportunity to, to host that event, which we've really enjoyed that the last couple of years. Yeah, sample some Atlanta crap brew, huh? Yeah, exactly. That'd be fun. Exactly. Yeah, cool. Cool. And then just a couple other notes here. Um, a reminder of some conferences that Chris and I will be at uh, in the next couple of months. So Chris is going to be at USSD from April 22nd to the 26th. So if you're in Seattle um, during that time, definitely go by the Kleinschmidt booth and find Chris. He'd love to chat with you about RAS or, or anything else. Um, and then I will also be at ASFPM, uh, which is the uh, American Society of Floodplain Managers. Um, and that conference is held in Salt Lake City this year from June 23rd to the 27th. Um, so come find me there. I'll be giving a presentation um, on some low flow modeling in an arid climate in eastern oregon so um, ras related uh, it'll be a, it'll be a cool topic um, any other news and notes chris around upcoming events or things to know i think you got it covered although i'm looking forward to our trip to boston we ben and i are going to boston next month and uh that ought to be a really good time um i mean we we both went to boston a few years ago right but it was just like a quick drive-through kind of thing 
Yeah. So we'll have some opportunity to explore a little bit. And uh, I've got family back there too. So it's always good to get back to Massachusetts and see that very historic city, really cool downtown area. And um, yeah, so it'll be fun. Very cool. Awesome. Well, to start off the technical discussion today, I want to go back in time and uh, engage with some of the listeners that provided uh, some questions for us. Um, we appreciate everybody that submitted their questions on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Um, we are going to try to do a better job of monitoring the questions that come in from that and picking out ones that we think make sense to try to answer on this on this podcast. There are some great questions that were on there that were probably a little bit more intensive uh, in terms of what it required to answer that. Uh, on a on a podcast, uh, but still we we saw those. Keep them coming, and we'll we'll try to pick out ones to to answer next month um, on that podcast episode. So this week's question that we're going to answer is from Ayana from Romania, and they ask: Is it possible to use the raster calculator function in RasMapper to calculate at what time the maximum flow reaches a specific location in a two D model? Uh, this is a great question. Chris and I had a chance to kind of talk about it a little bit before the podcast, and we think we have some some good insight to share with you all. Um, for many folks that listened to that question or heard that question, you might be thinking right off the bat, well, there's an arrival time map in RASMAPPER. Why don't we just use the arrival time map? And Chris, I'm going to go ahead and pull up RASMAPPER on my screen to share some things. But yeah. while I'm doing that, if you want to talk a little bit about why the arrival time map wouldn't be able to answer the question that I am I have here. Yeah, so specifically, Yana talked about maximum flow, right? And the arrival time map tracks water surface elevation or depth as another way to look at it. And so you can set up an arrival time map very easily. Ben's going to show how to do this. And uh, you can even specify not just when water first arrives, but when it gets to a certain depth at a certain location. Um, but that's again, based on water surface elevation or depth, not flow. Um, so there is no direct way to get a arrival time map based on flow or even maximum flow, which was the specific question here. Yeah, yeah. However, you can get an arrival time very quickly, uh, arrival time map very quickly for depth and including a maximum depth, which is the one right below arrival time. So you have arrival time and arrival time max. Now that's not going to technically be the same as your arrival time for maximum flow. Although as long as there's no significant backwater through the system, it might be, or probably is going to be very close to the same. Yeah. So let me go ahead. This this simulation that I have pulled up here is a it's actually a dam breach analysis, so it's a good one to use. Um, if I scroll back to the start of the simulation, you're going to see that we actually start with with water um, in our main channel at the beginning of our simulation, uh, and then during the course of this simulation, we have the dam breach that actually occurs. The flood wave moves from left to right, so from upstream to downstream on the screen. And you can see that 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 flood wave pass through. So Iona's a question. Iona's question was, hey, if there's a location, for instance, where we have maybe these cross sections drawn in here, is there a way for me to tell mm -hmm. what my at what point my maximum flow occurs at this at this location? And there's a couple of different ways to do this. So let's start with the simplest way. If you're only interested in the peak flow at a specific cross section in your 2D area, you can extract that using a profile line. Which is which can be added here under features. Profile lines allow you to monitor and observe um, information, either terrain or output information across mm -hmm. a line that you draw inside of a 2D area. If you right click on that profile line, you see there's a lot of different options here. What we're going to end up doing is plotting our time series and plotting our flow time series across this line. It's going to go ahead and generate a flow hydrograph based on the results underneath this line, and then it's going to display what that is. Um, so you can see here, this is actually upside down because I drew it, I believe I drew it right to left. From right to left, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, this is still helpful to help us understand when the peak of the flow arrives at this particular location. So you can see at the beginning uh, of the simulation, we got about a little under 1,000 CFS. So that's our base flow condition. Then that we got uh, probably like a hundred year or PMF 
uh, flow hydrograph, which is starting to really increase the flow significantly. And then we have that, that breach, right, which puts things over the top. And if we if we scroll our mouse down to the very peak of this uh, flow hydrograph, you can see that the time where the peak occurs is January 4th, 1999 at 2.30 p.m. So if you were able to take 2.30 p.m. minus whenever the simulation started, that gives you kind of the time of arrival of the peak flow at this particular location. That's the simplest way to do things, but that only works for one location. If you wanted that for multiple locations, you'd have to draw multiple profile lines and it could be kind of a pain. Um, what, yeah. Chris, what Chris noted there is the uh, arrival time maximum map, which is going to give us a solution to this question in many circumstances, but not all. And Chris, I'll go ahead and add this map in. And if you want to maybe shed some light on when this map would not give us uh, the information that that the user was interested in for this particular situation. Yeah, so again, arrival time max is going to be based on a water level. Um, in this case, the maximum water level. When does the maximum water water level happen uh, during the simulation? And it tracks it from whatever the um, starting time is. And you can either set that to this to the beginning of your simulation or some specific time during the event. Maybe you pick out when the breach begins, uh, if it's a breach model. So um, as far as getting max flow, I mean, you like I said before, you could use this uh, arrival time max as a way to get a pretty good idea of when max flow gets there. Uh, and it might be very accurate as, you know, in areas where you don't have a lot of backwater, but in areas of backwater, max flow and max stage do not necessarily correspond together at the same time. There may be a little bit of an offset there. Um, so just be careful with that. But if you're just looking for a you know quick ballpark idea about how long flow will take to peak out at some location downstream, then pull open that arrival time max map and just uh, understand what you're getting there. You're not getting max flow, you're getting max depth, um, but that could probably give you a lot of good information. Yeah, and just to review how you add that map, so you can right click under any plan once you run that plan. So you can see I'm under results. I have a couple different plans here that I've ran. I'm gonna look at our 250 foot cell plan, right click, create a new result map layer, pop open our hydraulic map type, and scroll down to arrival time and you can see we have our arrival time which is going to be more helpful for like levee breach analysis where we're starting off an area dry and then there's a flood wave arriving um, but for a kind of a map showing when the maximum stage or the maximum water service elevation occurs click on this arrival time max go ahead and add that map in um, and then what i always like to do is right click on that map go to the layer properties and click on this update legend with view. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna scale uh, the output here based on my current view. So right now, the arrival times are from, from 58 hours to 119 hours is, is kind of the, the possible range of, of peak stage for, for this particular scenario. If I zoom into this cross section, which we were interested in before, you can see that all these arrival times are very close together, which you would expect because there's a a dam breach wave going through that's going to move through pretty quickly and you can see at this location the arrival time or when the peak of my stage is reached is right around 74 and a half hours um, after the start of this simulation and you can get this information not only at this location but anywhere in time and space along the center line of my river channel here so um, i think that answered the question that was was uh, posted there so thank you for for asking and um Certainly keep questions coming. We'd love to answer additional questions that come in that we can you know, answer in a few minutes on, on this sort of forum. Yeah, or even, even on this particular question, if some of you out there have a better way or an alternative way of yeah. figuring this out, uh, share it with us. We'd like to share it with everybody else. Um, there's like a lot of things in HECRAS, there are many different ways to get to the same answer. Um, yeah. So yeah, pass along your your knowledge as well. So yeah, good question though. Absolutely, cool. Um, and we will try to, if there are updates to the question or if there are additional ideas or, or methods that folks use to answer the, the question that, that we just went through, we'll try to share that on the next pod podcast to keep this kind of as a rolling, a rolling, rolling learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
All right, uh, next topic is some water resource related news, uh, specifically in the HEC RAS arena. Um, and that is the new HEC RAS 6.5 version 6.5 was released a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, very, very excited about that. Was reading through the release notes and the new features uh, that are included, as well as some of the bugs that were fixed from the previous version. And it sounds like there's some really interesting things particularly on the sediment transport side of things. So I know Stan and, and his team have been working really hard to improve the functionality of, of 2D sediment transport. Uh, if you're using that function quite a bit, there sounds like there's some, some really interesting features. We're not gonna touch on those today, mm -hmm. um, but we did wanna mention a few that stood out, Chris, to you as you were looking few, uh, through the release notes. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you to kind of talk yeah. through what those are. Yeah, let me get my screen uh, shared up here. And the first one I want to talk about, and we'll get to the others here in just a second. Uh, but the first one I want to talk about is this new compare model results or new compare model data feature. This is something I've been wanting for a very long time, and they finally put it in here. Uh, I'm still learning it myself, but I want to give you some of the highlights. If you go to file on the main RAS window, go down to model, um, compare model data. It'll bring up a window like this. And what you're going to see here are all of your input files kind of linked together. So we have our plan files here, the second column over. We have flow files to the left, geometry files to the right. And then over uh, on the far right are our terrains. And you can see how lines kind of connect everything up. So you can quickly go through and go, OK, for plan four, what are my flow files or my flow file that goes with it, my geometry file? And you can see there's it's connected with G13 and U01. Um, and you can even figure out, OK, well, what terrain does that geometry go with? What's it associated with? And it points to uh, the terrain. So that's kind of helpful. But there are other things you can do here as well. OK, so let's say that we want to uh, compare different plans and what, what are in those different plans. Uh, maybe you're interested in the equation set that's used and you want to make sure that all of your plans are using the same equation set or maybe a certain coefficient or maybe your theta value, whatever the case may be. You can quickly compare plans, either a handful of them or all of them, and you just would click right click and say add to list here and that puts a tab at the top. Right click the next one, add to list. Uh, and I'm just going to add. Now, some of these are not enabled because they haven't been run yet in my particular um, instance of this project. This is the Bald Eagle Creek one, by the way. So I'm going to add, let's just add three for now, but you can add as many as you want. And then once you've added these plans, now we can go to plan, the plan tab up here on the left, and it's going to give you general plan information, like the title of the three different plans, the plan name, some basic stuff. Here's this is interesting. You can, if you want to verify that the time step is what you think it should be for each of these plans, you can double check on that. But what I was getting at before are the plan parameters. Mm -hmm. So I can click on plan parameters here and I can see, okay, what are the things that are different in these plans? Now, the equation set that I mentioned earlier is not listed here. The reason it's not listed is because it's the same. So it's only listing the differences, but I can have it check. I can check all and then I can see everything down here, not just what's different, but everything. And so if I uh, let's see, where is that uh, equation set? Um, why am I not seeing that in here? Well. Yeah, is it under 2D floor areas, Chris? No, oh, okay. I thought it might be. <clears throat> I know it's somewhere because you and I have both looked at it. Yeah, we looked at it before. I don't know why it's not showing up. But anyway, you if can you see go, there's what if you a, what if you go to flow? Flow? Oh yeah, it's just the flow file. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so um anyway, you can see a bunch of other things in here too. Like um you know, your max iterations, water surface tolerance, uh, a lot of 1D, 2D stuff, how many warm up time steps that you have set, um, getting into 1D things like the friction slope method that's used, what gravity value is used. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, Ben, but you can change gravity in HECRAS. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. 
Um, so quick way to compare different things. Um, we can do the same thing with geometry files. Now I don't have any geometry files selected, so let's let's see if we can add those. Let's just add a couple. Then I go into the geometry tab up here, compute geometry differences. So it's looking through both of the input files and it's going to show you the differences between That's them. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and there's even graphical representations of of different things as well. So it's really cool. I, as you can tell, <laughs> Ben, I'm still learning this myself. So here's a nice nice little plot of the difference in n values, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the data set. And so this is a spatial map showing me where do I have differences in n values? Okay, anywhere it's kind of this gray color that you see over here in the legend, that means there's no difference. Okay, blue means a negative difference and orange means a positive difference. So you can quickly see how geometry changes spatially in your model as well. So really powerful stuff. I'm I'm eager to continue to learn this and use this. I want to use this for reviewing models a lot uh, because this is, you know, this is something I do a lot in our company, and you do too, Ben, that we review other people's models. And one thing that I like to check is that, hey, are you using the right parameter or the right equation set? Or you're, you've got consistency between plans of, say, the time step you're using. Mm -hmm. This is a quick way to do this uh, rather than having to open up one plan, look for all this stuff, close that plan, open another one, look for the same thing over and over again so yeah so outside of because qaqc obviously is the one that is obvious in terms of what this was probably created for and and where it's going to be most helpful can you think of anything else chris put you well, on the spot here a little bit where this could be useful yeah i mean even for your own self-review you know once you start getting to 10 20 30 or more plans it's really hard to keep track of everything and it takes a long time to verify every plan has the same whatever uh, or th that you have consistency. And so this would just be a very quick way, even for your own model, just to verify, hey, you know, is everything looking correct? Is any surprises in here? So um, I think self-review, I think uh, independent review are two very important reasons um, or benefits for having this thing. So uh, there's probably other things as well, um, but those are the two that come to mind off the top of my head. Good, awesome. Well, yeah, that's a great feature. Looking forward to get, getting more familiar with it and building it into our standard operating procedures when it comes to, to reviewing reviewing models, like like you said, Chris. Um, yeah. There was, some, there was uh, like I said, there was a number of updates we really could do probably multiple hours going through all of the different features that have been added, but we picked this one as well as the next one, which is going to lead really nicely into our, our topic for today. Um, the primary topic for today that we're going to discuss is, is 2D bridges, best practices yeah. and potential pitfalls. But the update uh, related to 2D bridges um, that, that came in version 6.5, I think is worth touching on. So Chris, you want to talk a little bit about what, what that, what those changes were? Yeah, so I'll talk real quick about what the changes are. Then I want to give a little bit of um, history on 2D bridges and get into some best practice here, best best practices. So the changes that are most important here is that you have an automatic skewing option now for 2D bridges. So if I go open up a, um, a bridge, let's this is the Bald Eagle Creek data set, the one I always like to show people because it's got everything in it it comes with the software um really good stuff but you can see that this particular plan in the bald, bald eagle creek the one that says single 2d area with bridges feq um that's the one that we want you want to look at if you're interested in seeing how bridges are done but there's several bridges in here you can kind of see a lot of these are labeled here but i'm going to zoom in because there's one in particular down here that's really skewed Okay, um, let's look at this Highway 220 bridge. So let's zoom in there. Again, I'm looking in the geometry window. Uh, you can see this in RAS Mapper as well. But um, when you edit this bridge, if I go to Edit Connection, left click on it, Edit Connection, you see the um, SA2D Connection Editor. And that's what we use for 2D bridges, by the way. 
But under options, now you can see there is a SKU bridge data option that's been added in 6.5. Click on that and it allows you to skew it from negative 45 to 45 degrees. Uh, positive being a clockwise rotation of the bridge, negative being a counterclockwise. So if I look at this bridge, if it was unskewed, it'd be like this. So this one is a counterclockwise rotation. So I would give it probably something like negative 45 degrees. It's a pretty extreme skew here. Now, why do we want to skew it? Well, because in 2D bridges, we are using the bridge curves, right? And I'll get into the bridge curves here in a second. If you don't skew this bridge, then RAS is going to think it has more capacity to pass flow than it actually does. Because it's going to think this width from here to here is the actual hydraulic width of the bridge, when in reality, the hydraulic width is more like this, All right? So you want to skew this. Up until this new feature was added in, you'd have to skew it manually. And in fact, skewing it manually caused some problems in earlier versions, uh, 641 even, that it would artificially block part of the channel if you manually skewed it. It was kind of a weird thing, um, a bug in the software. But um, they were aware of that, and so they fixed it by putting this skew option in there. So if you have skewed bridges, definitely get into version 6.5. Make sure you skew it there, and then you're going to have a much better result. Ben and I worked on a project recently um, where we had a lot of 2D bridges, and several of them were skewed. Yeah. And um, it caused a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. It did um, without having the skewing option in here. So I'm glad that they added that in there. Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to being able to use that as opposed to the kind of the jerry rig approach that we came up with to <laughs> make it work. Um, which is yeah. Yeah. So let's um, let's step back a little bit, Ben. Um, and here's a trivia question for you. Oh, okay. okay. We, we, we like to do trivia every every episode, and um, I've got one for you, Ben. And that is, what version of HECRAS did 2D bridges, um, or were 2D bridges added? In what version? Yeah, um, I, I believe it was 6.4, am I correct? You got the first number right. <laughs> It 6 was 6.0. 6.0, 6 yeah. Yeah. Oh, 6.0 introduced man. introduced bridges into 2D areas. But here's the funny thing is uh we had 2D areas all the way back to version five. So we've had we've had 2D modeling in HECRAS, Ben, if you can believe it, since 2014. 2014. Way back when you were in what middle school or something, no, or the year the year before I started working. <laughs> okay, okay, you were still at Gonzaga, um, <laughs> on campus watching every single basketball game in person, right? Um, and two D two D modeling was introduced, but it didn't have bridges in it in in the two D areas, and so um, it was a little bit difficult if you were trying to model a, a river in two D and you had some bridges, you kind of had to get creative. Uh, you know, either you just didn't model the bridge or I even saw some people would insert little um, short 1D reaches you know, between 2D areas just for the bridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it was kind of not it was not great. Um, There's a lot of. Getting creative that had to be done to, yeah, to get around yeah. not having 2D bridges, so I it was like really nice when they added that. The best yeah. approach I remember seeing was, you know, if if you could kind of coding the bridge in as a culvert opening, right? Yep. Yep. People were doing that uh, or as a gate. That's another way to do it. Um, but of course, then you were using culvert equations or gate equations, yeah. not bridge equations. Mm -hmm. um, and then you sometimes you got really lucky and you had that model that had a bridge and you're like, oh, no, you know, what are we going to do with this bridge? And then you realize, right. Oh, Didn't the water the doesn't corner. touch yeah. the deck. Yeah. yeah, the water doesn't touch the deck. And so we don't actually need to include a bridge here. We have the abutments and the roadway embankments as part of the terrain. And then just we didn't put a bridge in at all and just modeled it fully 2D and it worked great. But that was only if the water didn't touch the bridge deck. So 
anyway, fast forward to version six, 2D bridges were added and now we're at version 6.5 and we've got skewing added to 2D bridges. But I wanna show you a little bit about uh, best practices for 2D bridges since we're on that topic. So as you, uh, as you know, Ben, and a lot of our listeners know, uh, with 2D bridges, we end up with these, I don't know what they're technically called, but these temporary cross sections. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I, I, I call them dummy bounding, cross sections yeah, or bounding cross sections. Bounding cross sections. Yeah. Whatever you want to call them. But RAS uses these temporary cross sections here to, br to build a family of rating curves for this bridge. And the family of rating curves are based on the exact same methods used for 1D unsteady flow for bridge curves. So if you've ever done any 1D unsteady flow modeling, you know that bridges have these H tab curves that go with them, okay? And this is just pre-processing the geometry of the bridge into a family of rating curves. That way, when you run the model, instead of having to recompute the headwater, tailwater flow relationship, you're just picking those values off of a pre-developed table and it makes the model run way faster. So they decided to use the same technique for 2D bridges. Develop these rating curves, this headwater tailwater discharge relationship, but instead of using the 1D solution, use those rating curves to include an additional force term in the momentum equation for the 2D equations or the 2D simulation. So every single cell face that runs down this center line has a pair of cells associated with it, a headwater side and a tailwater side, headwater, tailwater, right? So RAS will take those family of curves and it will convert that into an added force term that's applied at each of these faces. Okay. And then it just runs the 2D equations just like it normally would it just has that additional force term that was taken from the rating curves mm -hmm. so what you have to do is you have to develop those rating curves and that's what these dummy or temporary cross sections are all about because you need these four sections to build those family of rating curves and so raz does that for you you just have to specify where these sections go relative to your bridge. And then um, when you hit compute, RAS will pre-process that into um, the family of curves. Now, there is some stuff you have to do up front to get this to work right. First of all, locating these cross sections. If you go to the uh, connection editor here and get into the deck and roadway editor, you'll see there's a distance value and a width value. So the width value is the width of the bridge deck at the top of the bridge. The distance value is the distance from the edge of the bridge to these bounding sections. So what should we use for these values? Well, width is pretty easy, right? It's just the width of the bridge. That's a physical thing you can measure. But what, what do you think, Ben, about the distance value? What should we use for that? Yeah, I would say if there is like an embankment um, on either side uh, of our bridge, um, so on the left, river left or the river right side of, of our bridge opening, I would be tempted to put those cross sections at the toe of of the embankment on either side. But what what do you yep. think, Chris? That's exactly right. And you can kind of see the roadway embankment here. Mm -hmm. um, you can see this cross section is not at the toe. It's on the embankment. So what does that mean? Well, this embankment is actually going to influence the uh, the cross section in the family of curves, and we don't want that to happen. So it's better to have these, better to push them out so that they're both, um, you know, at the toe or a little bit beyond. And so you might want to increase this distance, uh, if this were my model, so that this one pushes out more to the toe. Okay, but you you don't want to go too far away, right? Because these cross sections are supposed to represent what's happening at the bridge. So if we push this way downstream here, well, that's totally different geometry than what's mm -hmm. happening at the bridge. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll let me move to a different bridge because it's hard to describe this with a skewed bridge. So I'm going to go to one of these other bridges here. Like, uh, let's do this railroad bridge. How about 
this is another bridge. This is the great thing about the Bald Eagle Creek data set is there's a lot of things you can look at and test out and verify. Okay, so here we can see, and by the way, this purple, this is just the 2D area Manning's region. So I'm going to turn that off because we don't really care about that right now. Um, okay, so now we can actually see the, the channel here and you can sort of see the embankments. The terrain is not very good in this part of the model, but you can sort of mm -hmm. see where the where the toe is. So you would push that out, right? But you definitely do want to have it um, as close as possible, just not, you know, up on the embankment itself. Now, so Chris, one question. Yeah, I, I think people probably are thinking right now that are new to two D bridges is, you know, we're, we're when we draw in our cross sections for one E bridges, we're taught that we want those bounding cross sections to kind of be at the the terminus of the expansion and the contraction of flow that moves through that bridge. Um, so they're going to be quite a bit further out than the bridges that we have here. Is there a reason why those cross sections aren't kind of matching the typical placement of those uh, bounding cross sections for 1D? Yeah, that's a great question, Ben. And that's because we don't care about contraction and expansion in 2D models. Well, I shouldn't say we don't care. We don't care the same way we do in 1D because for a 1D model, we would have another cross section up here where contraction starts to begin. Yeah. Yeah, out here in the floodplain, and we'd have another one down here somewhere where expansion has, you know, completed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've got our 2D area here to solve that for us. So we don't care about that in a 2D model. That's done for us with uh, the 2D equations because mm -hmm. we're capturing flow in multiple directions. We're capturing contraction and expansion. One of the cool things about a 2D model is you can actually use the 2D model results to figure out your contraction and expansion reaches for a 1D model um, mm -hmm. of that bridge, if you were so inclined to do that. So in this case, you know, if you think of the four cross section setup that we've, you know, we do for 1D, where you have cross section one down here where it's expanded, yeah. cross section two here, three here, and four up here. We don't need cross sections one and four. We just need cross sections two and three plus the two internal cross sections. Gotcha. That's all okay. we need. Yeah, but now that's not to say if there's still a little bit more contraction or expansion from the bounding sections to the bridge itself that we mm -hmm. shouldn't include that. Mm -hmm. And you definitely should. And in fact, if you go into the bridge editor, you can see under options, there is a spot for bridge in effective areas. Now, this particular bridge, we wouldn't need it, right? Because the bridge... There are no abutments that are projecting into the water causing a contraction between the bounding section and the bridge section itself. Mm -hmm. There may be some in here somewhere. Let's see if we, this one has a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, so you might put a little ineffective flow right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I but know, you, I know, you, only, yeah. you only need to include those ineffective boundaries if it's, if the physical blockage that's causing that ineffective area is not included in the terrain, correct? If it's included in the terrain, that's going to be picked up by the 2D yeah. equations. Yeah, so let's say on this particular bridge, let's say I'm, I extended this bridge out here onto these roadway embankments. Now all of a sudden I have roadway embankments as part of my bridge geometry, and you're going to see on the sides of this a complete blockage, right, where these roadway embankments are, okay? And that means that the, see, this is the upstream inside. That means the upstream bounding should have some ineffective flows there because water will be contracting, okay, as it approaches the bridge section. Mm -hmm. There will be a little portion of this bounding section here. Let me zoom in on it. Oh, what happened here? Let's get back there. There's going to be a little portion you know, oop, let me zoom back out a little bit. Let's say this bridge extended onto the embankment. There's going to be a portion of this section that should be ineffective because water over here will not be moving in the downstream direction. It's going to be ponding. It's going to be contracting to go through this opening. Okay, so that would require some ineffective flows. And that gets to another best practice here, by the way, Ben, and that is when you're doing a 2D bridge, it's best to just include the free span portion of the bridge mm -hmm. notice here we just have the deck here we don't have the abutments included 
-hmm. Okay, leave that to the 2D area, like mm -hmm. you see over here and over here. Just put in the free span. Then you don't really have to worry about ineffective flows, number one. Plus, number two, if water goes over these embankments, you have the benefit of the 2D equations being used. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, instead of wrapping that in as part of the bridge. Yeah. Now, if I look at the shape of the cross section in the view that you're looking at right now on river left, it looks like that abutment is included in this in this bridge. I mean, you can see the the increase in the terrain elevation that goes up and above the bridge yeah. deck. So it is a little in, bit. Yeah. In theory, technically, you should put in an effective flow area in the bounding cross section upstream of that to account for what you're saying there, right? In theory. Yeah, in theory, a little bit. And you know, it's maybe a judgment call if you need that much, but it, it really depends to where this section is located. This one you can see is, is a little bit on the embankment, just like this one is. So I think mm -hmm. some of that's going to be picked up here as well. Okay. Let's look at the same thing on the downstream side. Oop. That's the next bridge. Sorry, I was moving bridges, not moving. Um, okay, so here's our bounding section, right? And it looks like, yeah, it doesn't go up as high. If I go back uh, to the interior, this gets up to like 575, okay, which is way up here. So yeah, I might want to put just a little bit of ineffective flow here mm -hmm. to account for that for that well, bit. So that's that's a good eye, Ben. Or yeah. or narrow the width of the bridge deck, right, so that it's it's right. only covering kind of the span. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So it's really up to you, you know, do you think you need to have, you know, this kind of blocked out on the previous? And yeah, I guess the question is, yeah, or the answer is yes, a little bit, uh, not a whole lot. Okay, so think about it, expansions and contractions uh, from these bounding sections to the bridge section itself and use that to inform where you're going to put your ineffective flows around there. So. What else do we have? There's contraction and expansion coefficients. Okay, those are, even though we think of that as being a 1D thing, those are actually used in the bridge curves. And so click on that and you can change to something different. The defaults are what the manual recommends we use for bridges. And so that's what they're gonna use. But if maybe this is a very extreme contraction and expansion bridge, a very small opening, relative to the full channel width, then you might bump these up a little bit. But generally speaking, most bridges, you're just going to keep the defaults for those. Now, the other thing that's um, important and is a little bit different, I mean, you can see if you're used to 1D bridges, a lot of this stuff is the same, right? But you do have to get into these bounding sections. Okay, under options, you would just go, let me just show you again real quick. Under options, go to external and internal bridge cross sections. Okay, here we see the four cross sections that you see in the schematic on the left. Here they're listed out in tabular form, and they're going to show you the station elevation points under these cross sections uh, based on the terrain underneath, as well as the left and right bank stations and the Manning's end value it's going to assign to these cross sections. Now, all of this is done automatically for you, except the Manning's end. You have to put something in here for Manning's end. Now you can have just one value at the top and that gets applied to the entire cross section, or you can spatially vary it if you want to by adding in more values here. Bank stations, it, oh yeah, go ahead. Is it fair to say that you probably want to use the same Manning's end values that you're using for the rest of your 2D area for the channel segment itself? So if you have, yeah. for instance, um, a channel specific Manning's end value in a Manning's end layer, you'd want to make sure that this Manning's end value matches whatever you're using for that channel layer so that there's not kind of a contradiction there. Absolutely. Yeah, I would see, okay, this cross section is pretty close to these faces here. What are the end values on these faces, cell faces? That's what I'm going to use here for my end value for that cross section. Uh, so yeah, usually, I mean, your channel will have one end value and you can just adopt that for the entire thing. Now, if you do extend your bridge, which Ben and I don't recommend you do, but if you do extend it out onto the roadway embankments, then you might have a different end value over there. Um, you know, maybe it's forested over there, um, mm -hmm. or maybe there's some pavement, who knows, but, um, 
if you're just keeping your bridge limited to the free span, then you're you're just pretty much just picking up the end value that's in the main channel there. And to do a high level overview on these four cross sections again. So just as a reminder, the upstream outside cross section is going to be just upstream of the toe of your embankment. The upstream inside and downstream insides are you can't edit those. Those are based on the, the physical width of your bridge. And then the yeah. downstream outside is going to be just downstream of the toe of the embankment, correct? Yep. Okay. And those two, the outside bounding sections are both based on this single value, this distance value. Yep. So they're always going to be the same distance mm -hmm. uh, upstream and downstream of the bridge deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people ask me too, you, you might recall this in the class we teach when we get to the bridge lecture, uh, the bridge topic, I'll get a question that's like, hey, what if um, our embankments are vertical? There's no slope to them. Where should we put those bounding sections? Should be they be like one tenth of a foot upstream and downstream of the bridge deck? And uh, I, you know, I don't know if that would cause problems. That sounds problematic to me. So I always recommend at least go the same amount as the dis the the width of your bridge. Just do that same value upstream of it. I think that's a pretty good spacing. Um, but I would not want to put it right next to the bridge deck. And honestly, I don't know why, like, I can't tell you what in the computations would give me hesitancy there, but it just doesn't feel right. <laughs> now, I don't know what you think about that, Ben. But. Well, one other thing that I think, again, folks looking at this and looking at the previous bridge that we were looking at may notice is that the bounding cross sections appear to be lined up very closely with the cells. The upstream cell faces and the downstream cell faces they're not spot on on this bridge they're really close on the other bridge is there any sort of requirement or recommendation to have though that um upstream and downstream bounding cross section kind of aligned to the upstream and downstream cell faces there's no requirement for that um but that gets us to another important part of bridge modeling that um we should talk about and that are that is these bounding cells but i mean just to get to your question no it doesn't have to fall on the face it doesn't have to be outside or inside the face it, it's really irrelevant um because these are two separate computations being done you have the family of rating curves that are only done with these cross sections and then once that's done that's done and that we've got our force terms and now we can run the 2d equation uh 2d equations and RAS at that point doesn't care about the cross sections anymore. It has the added force term on these uh, cell faces on the center line. It's all 2D from there on. And so it really doesn't matter if these things line up or not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very common question though. People assume, hey, because we have cell faces there, maybe they should line up. It doesn't really have to at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there is, there can be issues with these bounding cells. So another really cool thing that they added to version 6.5 with respect to bridges is the ability to spread out that force term over multiple cells through the bridge. Now, this bridge, it doesn't really matter because the cells themselves are way wider than the bridge. The but cells let's themselves, go... I like that. What's that? <laughs> The, cell, yeah, the cells to, themselves. The cells themselves. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to say that. But let's um, let's see. I had one that I was messing around with. Okay, so let's say we have this bridge here, and it's it's really wide, or we have really small cells, or both, right? And here you can see we've got multiple cells in the direction of flow underneath this bridge. That last bridge we're looking at it just had one cell not even a full cell on either side of the center line but here we've got multiple cells well previous to version 6.5 ras would take that force term and only apply it on the center line faces and so for a bridge like this where you've got you know potentially a lot of energy loss going through the entire bridge that would all be collected together and applied right here at this face or these faces on the center line and so you get a real sudden drop, head loss there, um, head drop applied in a very discreet and short location, right? And thing Ben and I always talk about is 
Raz doesn't like things to happen drastically, right? So this situation would cause a lot of errors. It would cause your model really slow down as it's chugging on these errors. And so what HTC did for 6.5 is they spread that force over all of the cells underneath the bridge and added it incrementally as you go through the length of the bridge, which smooths things out a lot better and makes it more accurate too, in my opinion. So that was a really nice um, addition for version 6.5 with uh, respect to bridges as well. Very cool. What about uh, yeah. what about peers, Chris? 2D bridges and peers, are there some best practices or potential pitfalls that people need to look for when they're putting peers into their model? Yeah, so there's another really common question we get, Ben and I get are, um, what's the best way to model a peer? Well, I'll tell you one thing you don't wanna do. If you, if you put in a bridge, Let's go look at um, some of our SA2D connection bridges. You can see we have some piers here, right? That's the railroad bridge we were looking at earlier. So a lot of piers in here. Um, let's say for this one, we put these four piers in, in the bridge editor. If we did this, we would not want to add those in as part of the terrain. And that's the other way to simulate a bridge. So you wouldn't want to do both in the bridge editor and as part of your terrain. You'd want to pick one or the other. Uh, if you do both, then you're going to be double counting the uh, the losses associated with these peers. So option one is to make them part of your bridge geometry using this peer button right here. Really easy to add peers in. You just go to the peer button. You add in one peer at a time from the bottom up using this peer width elevation relationship. OK, and you've got some peers really easy to do. OK, um, this is great for bridges where the bridge happens to be in your modeling domain you want to make sure you're kind of capturing the um the backwater effects of that bridge um the the flood risk due to that bridge um you know how it might change overall the the flow patterns or the the velocity as it approaches and leaves the bridge site that's great now what if we were actually simulating the hydraulics around one of those piers? Okay, let me zoom back into this new bridge, let's say, for example. And let's say we've got one pier right in the middle here. And uh, the focus of our study is to get the hydraulics around that pier so we can do a scour analysis, let's say. Or we just want to get the hydraulics really refined around that pier. That is the focus of our study. Maybe we want to do some force computations on it uh, for design. OK, I would rather put that in as part of the terrain than as part of the bridge geometry there. And so if you go into your um, into RAS Mapper to the location of that bridge. Uh, let's see, where is that? There it is right there. I'll zoom in and I can do a terrain mod on there pretty quickly and, and easily. So I'm going to turn off the structure for now just so that I can see a little bit easier. And I'm going to put a pier right here using a terrain mod. So I would just come down to my terrain. I've already got modifications included in here for some other things. So I'm just going to add a modification, right click, add modification, shapes, and let's do a, an elongated pier. How about? OK, I'll just call it peers, but it's going to ask for a name. And so now I'm in edit mode already and I've got my create new feature button turned on. I can just come in here and click anywhere I'd like to put an elongated pier. If you look closely, it's already got an elongated pier there, but it's too small, so I'll have to adjust that. But I'm going to stamp it here first. And when I do that, it's going to ask me for some information. OK, so yeah, I'll replace terrain value. I'll make it uh, the elevation just really high. And I always forget what Bald Eagle Creek is, but I'm just going to guess 350 for now. I want to rotate it because it's going straight up and down now. So I want to make it maybe about, let's say, 60 degrees rotation. See how that does. And the width, I'm going to make it uh, much wider. Let's make it a big 30 foot wide pier. And I'm going to make it uh, 60 feet long. That's a huge pier. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big river too. Um, 
So let's see. Radius. I'll probably want the radius to be like the width as well um, on both sides. Okay, let's see what that does. Okay, so there's my pier. Let's zoom in and see where it, okay. Uh, I could probably make it longer. Um, maybe uh, I'll go back to edit feature, click on this, and I can just graphically move this in theory. Yeah, I don't think you can. I've never seen that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, gives us, it gives us the handles, but nevertheless, I can edit it if I right click on it and maybe I'll make uh, the rotation a little bit more so it's more aligned with the direction of flow. So let's see if 65 does it and then I'm going to make it uh, I'll make it 100 feet long. A real monster pier here. OK, that looks better. And. Um, When I hit apply, in theory, oh no, it's only going to let me stamp um, after I've made the change here. So what was it, 65? Okay. Okay, so now if I want to add more, I can just start stamping them like this. Okay. Uh, but I said I was only going to make the one, so we'll just do that. Uh, so I'll come back in here to edit feature, and I'm going to delete that one, delete that one, delete those two. Okay, so now I've got a pier here. Of course, I would want to have much smaller cells around this, right? And probably some break lines too, don't you think, Ben? Yep. Yeah, it's going to be pretty important to make sure that your cells are small enough to capture those effects. Otherwise, you're kind of tricking yourself into what you can really represent with that. Yeah, yeah. So I would probably put a break line because I I would want a face on the edge here. So I'd put it probably, oops, just inside. I didn't draw that very well, but I'll uh, edit it. Just inside there, and then I'll do another one. Do another one like this, just inside. Okay. And then um, maybe I'll make the um, cells much smaller mm -hmm. around this. So let's make them probably even want smaller than that. But uh, well, let's start with five feet for both of these. Then I'm going to highlight them both and enforce. Okay, of course, I get some red dots somewhere else, and it's now it's conflicting with this break line that's going across here, um, which is actually a structure, not a break line. So it's going to be tricky. So I would have to do the same thing on this one. Yeah, it'd probably be easier to do it as a refinement region. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, so you could do a refinement region, but the bottom line is you're going to want to have smaller cells, like like maybe not this small, but definitely of the order magnitude of the width of the pier or smaller for sure yeah uh in order to get the hydraulics really good there so just something to consider it's it's a lot of work but you can do piers as part of the terrain as an alternative to to doing them as part of your bridge good awesome well we've been able to touch on uh you know where to place the center line span for a 2d bridge talking a little bit about the bridge curves and how the added force term is actually incorporated talking about where those bounding bounding cross sections should be placed and when you need to add ineffective flow areas in place and when you don't need to add ineffective flow areas a little bit mm -hmm. about peers um was there anything else chris that you thought was worth sharing for folks just around best practices and potential pitfalls Obviously, there's a lot more to discuss with 2D bridges overall, but um, anything on those two topics in particular? I'll, I'll leave you with one more thing on uh, 2D bridges in particular. Smaller is not necessarily better for a 2D bridge. Um, you know, if you, a lot of times the, the tendency is to, hey, I'm getting some errors. Let's make some smaller cells here. Um, not always going to improve in fact might make those errors even worse what i found is that uh and it's hard to do this on a skewed bridge so let me go to a different one i'm going to go to one up here uh that's not so skewed 
let's get rid of these computation points. It's harder to see. Um, okay. Okay, so here's a good one here. Not very skewed, um, but what I found is you want to have, I mean, you still want to have good resolution across the channel. So, you know, kind of minimum five cells, maybe minimum six or seven, somewhere in that range. But you do want bigger cells so you can elongate them. And so one thing that I'll do here, you can kind of see that these are sort of elongated, but that's just coincidental. But I'll come in here and I'll um, turn on the computation points a lot of times. And I will do something like this. I'll, uh, let's get into edit mode, computation points. And I'm going to delete these. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I want to select. Yeah, so I'm going to delete these like this. Now you can see I've got another geometry on somewhere else. So I'll make sure I turn that off here in a second. OK, where's that other geometry? It's probably in the results. Yeah. Uh, no, it's the test no? bridge. It's the last geometry in the layer. Oh, yep, you're right. There it is. Okay. So then what I'll do is I'll take these cells here like this. Ah, I'll delete them. Hit the, hold the control key so you can select multiples. Gotta have a really fine touch on your mouse to get these little points here. And these are hard to see. Come on. There we go. Okay, so now I've got them all selected. I'll just drag them down like this. Try to keep them in the same alignment, okay? Because what we wanna do is preserve the, um, the break line here. Um, what did I do? Oh yeah, I'm gonna have to get rid of these too. Yeah, so then you get rid of them on this side as well. And then you end up with really long skinny cells, right? So I'm not gonna take the time to get rid of these, but you would do the exact same thing on the other side. And now you've got long skinny cells, right? And that's gonna give you more surface area, which is gonna give you more volume per cell, but we still have the lateral resolution that we need to capture the hydraulics um, and the uh, velocity distribution across the channel, okay? And by having these larger cells here, it better absorbs flow coming from upstream to downstream and minimizes those nuisance errors that can really slow down your model. Um, just something that I found over doing bridges a whole bunch of times that it sometimes helps. And this would be specifically for if bridges were being included in a model where obviously any of the results inside or near the bridge were not an area of interest. So not doing scour analysis, not doing any sort right. of detailed analysis of, of flow, stage, or velocity inside of the bridge. Because if that was the case, you'd certainly want to do the opposite of this. You'd want to make a lot of refinement inside of that area to really get a good distribution of velocities and whatnot. Yep. Yep. And then it's a totally different model, right? It's it's a near field model and you'd probably want to cut out the rest of your model and just have a kind of a zoomed in modeling domain. And you can use the bigger model to inform the uh, boundary conditions of the smaller near field model. But yeah, you're right. You're going to have a much different model with much smaller cells in that case. Yeah. And I'll just go back to something that we started this conversation with Chris, which is, you know, the you had said that it, in previous versions before 2D bridges were available, you kind of got lucky if the water service elevation at your particular bridge wasn't high enough to strike the low quarter of the bridge, and therefore you didn't need to yeah. include it. That's yeah. still the case, right? I mean, if you have a, a model with a lot of bridges, 
run the model before you include the bridges to get an idea of generally what the water service elevation is and what the elevation of the high cord is at these locations. And if it's not close to the low cord, don't go through with this all this work to put these in. Um, so that, that that still holds true. You don't need to add yeah. the bridge just because we have the feature available. They really need to be mm-hmm. added in locations where it's a point of emphasis. It's a it's a, uh, a location that you're really wanting detailed results for. Or if the water service elevation that you're modeling um, gets high enough to, to strike the low cord of the bridge. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think personally, I think it's better to model it as a 2D uh, area without a bridge if it's not hitting the deck. Because when you model it as a bridge, if it's not hitting the deck, it's going to use a low flow method in RAS, either the energy, momentum, or Yarnell equations. Either of those are available to you. Well, None of those are going to capture what's going on through that bridge better than the 2D equations would for a low flow case. So yeah, just don't put the bridge in at all in that case. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's a, a good good point to end this particular discussion on. Chris, unless there's anything yeah. last minute that you wanted to add in. No, I think that's good. Um, glad to share this with people because um, People are doing 2D bridges more and more, and there's a lot of questions that come up. We get them all the time in our class, um, right, Ben? When we get to that 2D bridge, the questions come flying. We get to that lecture, right? Uh, everybody's interested, and bridges are everywhere over streams, so it's uh, you're bound to run into one when you uh, when you have to do a HECRAS model, whether it's 1D or 2D. Uh, they're kind of hard to avoid. They're everywhere. Yeah. Be good. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for talking through that stuff with us, Chris. Um, next week, uh, we will be discussing 1D versus 2D restoration modeling. So RAS models are are used for a lot of different types of projects. Uh, more and more, you're seeing them used in kind of the restoration space. Um, we have a workshop within our class all about kind of incorporating restoration design using 2D modeling. Um, and we're going to discuss kind of the pros and cons with with using 2D and then also the pros and cons with using 1D to do restoration modeling. Um, Because you would think in all situations, it's always gonna be better to use uh, 2D, but um, it's not necessarily always the case. So we're gonna get into that a little bit. We're gonna have a a guest on that bot, that podcast, uh, Robert Schomp, who's a a coworker of ours, who's done a lot of restoration modeling, both with 1D and 2D. And we're gonna pick his brain uh, on his experiences of which kind of method is appropriate for different objectives within uh, different projects. So, Yeah, that'll have, be a lot of fun. If you have uh, questions or experiences uh, doing 1D or 2D uh, modeling of, of restoration sites or restoration designs, uh, definitely leave your experience in the comments. Let us know how that's gone, what you've learned, uh, any tips and tricks you'd like to share, uh, and we'll try to pass those along as best we can. If you have other questions that aren't restoration related, please leave those in the comments too. And like I said, we're going to try to do a good job of reviewing those each month and uh, replying to the ones that make sense to, to answer on on this on this podcast here. Uh, that's all I got, Chris. Anything else before we close out? I'm wondering, Ben, do, when do you think HTC is going to put little analog fish in the software for restoration modeling? Think it'll ever happen? <laughs> well, it's gonna. They're gonna need to start incorporating some three D stuff. I think before we get to that point. Yeah. yeah well, we, I mean, there are trees in there now, so yeah. yeah why not? Yeah. yeah. So no, but that's good. Yeah. Um, looking forward to the next one. I really like doing restoration modeling. One of my favorite things to do. So it'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, this has been Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. Until next time.